Dr. Yonover. So Dr. Robert Yonover invented the sea slash rescue high visibility locating device and technology and is now used by all branches of the US military. And today we're excited to hear his this renowned inventor and scientist talk about his entrepreneurial journey and experience with Shark Tank and SpaceX. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Yonover, and I'll be the floor to you. I got my PhD here working on volcanoes in the 80s. Let me see if this works. Here's my hero shot. My eyeglasses were singing. But I didn't work on subaerial volcanoes. I worked on submarine volcanoes. I mean, I worked on them a little, but my real PhD work is on ocean floor lavas. And my background is, you know, I'm, I'm doing these crazy things like working on volcanoes, going to the bottom of the ocean, surfing big waves. That, that's my big hero shot. It's 11 and a half foot board, so just for reference. I fish in rough water out of Kayibi Channel, so I'm always kind of on the edge. They say invent what you know, and when you're almost when you're in trouble and almost dying, that's when it's good to think of things. So that's what I try to do, and. Also, get inspiration from things. This is uh, Christo. You've heard of him? He's an artist. And this happened, I was flying to Kauai in a single engine plane. Let me see if, let me try it. There's the picture. So I'm flying from here to Kauai in a little plane, and it was a rented plane. It sounded like we're going down. I looked down, and that's all you see. Everyone knows what that is. We see this all the time. So what is on the plane? I'm like saying, well, there's flares, smoke, sea dye, all that stuff goes away right away. So I'm thinking about that. What, what can I do? That's when I flew and saw that Cristo wrapped those islands in pink, pink plastic. So that was like the nugget of the original idea. Like, I need a piece of pink plastic. So I started playing with it, but I could never get it to stop curling up and twisting up. And when I showed it to the Navy, they didn't like pink. You know, there's a not macho enough. So. <laughs> Turns out this this is what it, this is the original one of the original ones and let me if I have a volunteer I can show you what it what does. Sure. Okay. <laughs> just walk to the back and what I just, just walk that way and keep going. So this is the sea rescue streamer. You see these orange bars? That was the big innovation. I, you ever heard of biomimicry? Oh, yeah. you, you, you mimic what happens in nature. So how does a centipede? Keep it, keep going. All right. Long. <laughs> so, I mean, I could centipede, your vertebra a vertebrae, a segment to the coconut tree, they all have segmentation. Keep going. I'm not trying to get rid of you. Okay, just hold it for a second, I'm gonna show you. So okay. instead of curling and twisting up, you know what a helix is? It spins, see this? See how it spins? So the first time I did, made this, I didn't know if it was gonna work. I went out with my family and a friend that's on a boat and we just unfurled it and it was all crumpled up, but slowly the, the current took it out and it just kept spinning and it would either go on one side or the other, but it kept it, it you just lay it, lay it down, that's fine. So that's, this is the original 40 foot long one. This is actually from a fighter pilot version, but that's the same unit, okay? Can, can everyone see that? Okay, now, what's the difference between this and flare, smoke, and die? It doesn't go away, right? This is the, and when the Navy first approved it, it's the only permanent, passive, and you don't have to do anything. It's a passive signaling device, and also it's discretionary. Meaning if the enemy comes around, you can't pull a flare in or smoke back in or sea dye once it starts going out. And that stuff only lasts a few minutes. You could pull this back and then redeploy it as you need it. So I, it, it led to a bunch of military approvals and again, they're, they're, that's a little more close, closer version of it. And the, the route I took was the military. I knew that consumers, you guys don't care about you know, saving your lives. I mean, kind of true, you'd rather buy a six pack for your boat than something to save you. Until you really need it, if you really needed it, if I could go around the people that were lost at sea and say, hey, you want to buy this? While they're at sea, they'd pay me a million dollars for it. But before they go, but we know the military, they care. Now, they do they care 
about the person, or do they care about the PR of losing a person, or do they care about the training that goes into the person? Let's say all of that, but they care. So I went after the military, and the thing was it's made in USA, which was a huge thing, and you know, it's, it's such a simple device, and sometimes the simpler ideas are better. You know, it's, it's like bulletproof, it's so stupid simple. You know what KISS stands for? Keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. And my goal with this, okay, was always, I want to be in the, in the dictionary. I want the picture of KISS, my picture. I want to be, keep it simple. So I'm not, I'm not insulted when some people say, oh, that's so simple, I could have thought of that. I go, yeah, well, you did. But <laughs> anyway, so yeah. it's already saved some lives, and it was really cool. I met a couple people and saved, and they thanked me, and that genuinely, felt better than any of the money I've ever made. Because it's like, in your life, you start thinking, what, you know, what am I doing? What is it? Am I a purpose in life? So to do something you love and be your own boss, which is kind of the track you guys are on, which I like. You know, the, the real goal in life, to me, is never have an employee and never be an employee. That's the hardest thing of all. And I've kind of pulled that off. And there's, you can go licensing. There's a lot of ways to do that, but it's hard. And the, the, the thing is that I got into the water with the sharks, and I'm not talking about the shark tank, that's later, I'll talk about that, but the sharks being big companies. Big companies want to steal your ideas, and you got to protect it, and that's where the patent. I got really strong patents. When I was finishing my PhD, I worked with a smoke in the cockpit inventor, and he, he was really brilliant, but he was a horrible PR guy. He was like attacking the airlines and the FAA, so but I learned a lot of what not to do. But what I did learn to do is go in with a patent, and I guess I would call myself, uh, let's say, a pop, I'm a polite pain in the ass. Okay, if I want something from you, I'm gonna call you endlessly. And in the olden days, before there were regular cell phones, at 11.01 at night, it was cheap to make a phone call. It was way cheaper than 10.59. So at 11.01, I, my brother told me, the way to get stuff like this out is to get PR. You guys have social media, it's, it's a lot easier and harder at the same time. It's too crowded and noise. But there are editors sitting around wondering what to write about. So at 11.01, I sent like a fishing mission. I sent 100 faxes out to the editors of all these magazines and newspapers till I got one hit. The Miami Herald wrote about it. They have Navy approval, this could save lives. So I took that, sent that out 100 times. And someone like Outside Magazine, you heard of them? I talked to them for three years. I'm like, you guys need to write about this. Your people, your hikers and kayakers are dying because they're not using it. They said, no, nah. I go, when can I call you back? Two months. I make a note, call them back in two months. Keep calling them until they have the window, they put it in there. And the other thing is to let people run with it. Let them feel a little ownership in terms of the idea. You've heard of Men's Journal? They wrote about it, and they said Gilligan's Island. You heard of that? Gilligan's Island would have been one episode if they had the streamer. That was funny. I didn't think of that. But you let these guys run with it, and you just keep working the PR. And again, the patents, trademarks, you have to protect your brand. And your pet patents are the most important if you can get them. And there's utility patents, which is like this, because it's a whole unique way to, to, to solve a problem. There's design patents where it just looks different. But these are the strongest patents. And here's the a picture of the original one, and notice that when it folded up, it came out of the hat. The hat turned into a hat, and again, same way the Navy didn't like the pink plastic, they didn't like the hat either. It was a little too dainty, and I understand that. So anyway, you gotta you gotta play play to your field, and then as I was saying, promoting it. That's the, that's the key. How do you get people to know about your idea? And you guys, you can go Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever you you can work with the media. But you know something? It starts on the grassroots. You gotta start small because you can try to get a big publication, but it's better to be a niche market and go to like scuba divers or sailors or military is not a niche, but that's one way I kept doing it and I still do it today. And here's some of the, my brother, I, I've been, I'm a self-proclaimed PR and I'll admit it. I've got no problem with it and you know, Whatever. I, I feel like I'm helping people do their job. I'm telling them about something interesting. I even got it in Playboy. I don't know if you heard of that. Just like, but it was no photo. You know, <laughs> trying to get a photo, but they wouldn't do it. Anyway, 
Discovery Channel, CNN, I got it all over the place, and it's cool. And I, you know, my that Miami Herald article started with one article, and now my book is too big. I used to carry it to me, it's huge. And that's not even with all the media stuff. That was before social media. So that was just print and broadcast. And it's just, the other thing about broadcast and print media, any media, is if you've got a third person talking about you, it's better than an ad. An ad is like, you pay for it, you can lie. But if someone looks at it independently, just like the Navy looked at it independently and approved it, so did the Air Force, so did the Coast Guard. That is credibility you cannot buy. So it's really good to let other people talk about your idea. You give them one, let them try it. That's really huge. And then they become your champions sometimes. They believe in it. So that helped me a lot. And the other nice thing, the streamer works on land too. And, and this is the, the latest one, small. Uh, somebody I think in the Coast Guard told us, you've got to make it smaller. And this is like a holster that fits on your pocket. And the divers want a small one too. So the other nice thing is it works on land and water. They, they tested it in the Navy in the Arctic Circle. That's the British British Navy, I think, tested it. Yeah, the same problem. Without it, with it. Simple. Stupid simple. We like that. Okay, all, all the Navy, the submarines use it. And also... One year I went to a trade show and they had all these million dollar cameras and infrared systems by Honeywell. Everyone had cameras, no one had targets. So my little, at the time, $50 piece of plastic was the hit of the show. Because the Marines were running around and they had nothing, you know, they, they were hiding and no one could find them. Then when they, when they held these up, you could spot them. So it was interesting how that developed. This was a big thing and we were, I was talking earlier about earmarks to someone else and we got one because the Air Force, you also want to, how you develop a product? One thing I've learned is get the simplest one out there first, okay? Because if you put too many bells and whistles on it, you get too bogged down. So what I do is just put the streamer out there, nothing else. I know everyone's saying, oh, you should put a light on it, you should put a reflector on it, and I did that eventually. Same with the Air Force. We like your streamer, but our fighter pilots, when they eject out, it's really violent. They get hurt, injured, and even dead but they want to find them, dead or alive. So, and this is a, a local kind of inspiration. How am I going to get this thing to go out automatically when it ejects out of a fighter pilot? I'm like, right, that, was a, that was a tough one. So, you guys have eaten rice paper candy? Oh, yeah. There's got to be plastic like that that melts in your mouth. Sure enough, this was in the early days of those little dishwasher things that you throw in the, before you guys started eating them. You know. <laughs> I contacted that company, we had sheets of them, and we rolled them into a little string, and we tied them into this, a pouch. In a half hour, that plastic turns into like rice paper, and it dissolves. And it, instead of rolled up a streamer, like I just unrolled it, it Z-folded, so it goes out automatically. And these lights have photo sensors on them, so and there's a magneto switch that'll arm it once it goes out, but it won't flash till nighttime because you don't want to waste the flash in the battery. So it flashes for one night, three nights, and turns off each day. Got a safe to fly approval. It's like, it actually, and then Air Force went to buy it and they said, you know something? And, and I had a little argument with them. Not argument, customer's always right. They said, I said that the light should be infrared, right? So the naked eye can't see them, just the night vision goggles. But they said, no, we control the skies, we control the water, we're going to make them bright. I go, okay. They made them bright, and then guess what? They said they're too bright. So I, I oversolved the problem. So it, it, it's really kind of a sad part of the story, because now only a few Air Force groups of our Air Force is using them, but someone like the Singapore Air Force, they have them on all their F-16s. So take that, but it was just, it, it, it's too visible. I never thought my idea to make people too visible would become, I mean, to make them visible would become too visible. But anyway, so strong patents led to, this is part of my pitch for the consumer side. We sold 20,000 units, 15 million in sales. And you might say, how did you do this all alone? I did. I signed a license agreement with a local company for 15 years and I had a, when you sign a license agreement, you want to both be on notice. So if you tell someone, here's, here's the streamer, you can have it, but I made them pay me a monthly um, royalty. So I didn't, they needed to 
sell to make money or because they had to pay me. If they didn't pay me, I put a caveat in there that makes it come back to me. So you see, for me, I didn't want this thing to die. And, and if you give it to a company or investors, at the end, they'll just send, sell the patent. Thing. I had a specific clause in there that says, if this dies and you don't want it, I want it back. And that's what happened. 15, I had it for 15 years. When the 15 years came up, the local company didn't want to put the money into it anymore, and I took it back. And I got the manufacturing stuff back, and now I've been controlling it for seven years, which is nice, because now it has, it's, it's, it's older than you guys, this stuff, which is cool. And there's no sign in it, end in sight. And we want to keep saying to you, like, this is what people think I do all day, and it's not true. This is, anyway, it's, it's this is just a review of the, of the and EPIRB, the other thing was EPIRB, the electronic devices only tell you that someone's there. They don't, you still need a visual. You talk to any Coast Guard, Air Force rescue pilot, they fly over water all day. It's just like this carpet. Did you think you could see a pinhead on this carpet? No way. But could you see an orange toothpick? Yes. That's what that thing looks like. Simple, stupid, and you know, it, it's been a good run. This is what I'm trying. This is where I was in a blue startup. You heard about that? Startup locally. I did a startup group and they were trying to be, get me to be into e-commerce. So I wanted to try to convince civilians, boaters, hikers, divers to use it. So trying to, you know, you, you gotta create numbers so people think there's a big market. So we determined with all these different sports, there's 100 million people. And my idea was to go after really the women, no offense to the guys. We're macho idiots that think nothing's going to happen to us. Women are a little smarter. They're like, you know, again, that's totally gender biased against my, my team, but I don't care. I think it's true. It's my opinion. Um, so it's for your loved ones. It's like your loved ones going fishing, diving. You may not. He, he is a macho idiot, but we want him to come back. We like him. If we don't like him, don't buy this. That was kind of the other. Anyway. It's really still tough to sell it to consumers. This is what it looks like now. It is on Amazon. Instead of this expensive light, I learned another thing in innovation. Remember I said that you get the basic one out first, then you add the bells and whistles. This thing costs like $1,000, this one. No one's buying, no consumer's buying for 1000 And even the military, once they know that exists, then they'll buy the simple one. It's like psychology, it's like, okay, we know it's good enough for fighter pilots, it's good enough for us. So I put military grade chem lights in there and reflectors and made it small like the holster. And now people will buy it because it's only like $95 and $104, not only. It's still money, but it's not $1,000. And again, these are just my glamour shots. Uh -oh. Oops, okay. And then, a couple of years ago, they had a Al Moana had an open casting call to Shark Tank, and and but you got to be on Shark Tank, you know, because I got I got a few good backstory, and I said okay, so I got up early because I don't want to sit in the sun in Al Moana, so I was like seventh in line, and you know I had my ducks in a row. I had patents, I had military approvals, it saved lives, I had 15 million sales, and I got the good backstory, and I just kept making the cut all the way, all the way to the show. And it was a cool experience, a lot of pressure, a lot more pressure than I have right now with you guys. You know, cameras everywhere, and, and you know, you know, that, that you, you go in there, and I can tell you this, that, that, that there's a little X like this, you walk out, you walk out that thing where the shark tanks are, you have to, the tank is, and you stand there. They, for 40 seconds, you have a stare down. You're supposed to look at each shark, and they look at you, and I'm like, okay, yeah. You know, it's like a boxing match or something, I was ready. And you look at Mr. Wonderful and, and uh, Mark Cuban, and it's like, and, and they said, do you want someone to help you demo it, like, like you just did? And they said, how about Damon? I'm like, yeah, but I'm gonna make a joke that's kinda, that could be, you know, I don't wanna be a racist on national TV, because I have a joke, and Mr. Wonderful, if anyone watched the show, he always gives to these people. I, I really, I'm mad at the guy. I don't even know him, but I'm mad at him. And I knew he was short, you know. So I go, I'm gonna have him be my guy. So, so when you, if you watch it, I, I, I can give you guys a link. He, he comes up for you to get it, and I give it to him. I'm looking right down on his bald head. It was great. 
shots. Then he goes out, and, and of course, the other sharks said, like I was saying, you keep going, get lost. They, I knew they would make fun of him. And the joke I used was, not joke, the truth is, your head's as big as a coconut. And, you know, his coconut, but um, both him and Damon are both bald. But if you say a coconut and a black guy, shiny head, it's better. It's funnier if it was the one. Yeah. Okay. That little backstory, but that was. And then at the end, this is another good little thing. They said, you know, I was pissed off. They all liked it, but no one did invest. I'm like, really? You guys don't want to save lives? It's save lives? We can also, imagine you guys being on. If you got all the money in the world, Mark Cuban, this guy's got all the money in the world. Not all of them, but he does. I go, you don't want to be part of saving one life? I, I'm telling you how good it feels. Like, ah, I don't see this. And he's so, so good with the military. It's a great product. We see. They all said it was great, but no one did best. And I was fuming because I, I, not on air. I, I, I was like, okay, whatever you want. But afterwards, they pull you to this other room and they get the post interview. And they're like, oh, were you disappointed? I go, yeah, I was disappointed. They'd rather invest in cupcakes than saving lives. It's a great line. Oh, camera guys <laughs> laugh, they drop the camera laughing, but you know something? They would never hear that. Because it's an indictment of the whole show. So Dang. anyway, that's I could go on forever about that. But it was cool, a lot of pressure. Gotta get your act together. I hope there's a public speaking thing going on. You 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 know the thing is if you know more about it than anyone, I, even in blue startups and even other shark tank people, you, you have to know your stuff better than anyone, then you're confident about talking about it. And if you're passionate about it and you like what you do, you really, that's why I try to pick stuff that I really like and, and can push. And this is the coup d'etat for me. I'm part of this Shark Tank group and I didn't get funded, but SpaceX called me, and I called me, they were at a trade show, and I didn't know this. NASA used it too, and like two weeks before the first SpaceX launch, they said, what, what should you have a, is this stuff dangerous? I go, no. They go, could you send out word MSDS? You know what that is? Materials data sheet, yeah. material safety data sheet to see if it's explosive. I don't even have one. It's a piece of plastic. So I just went online and said, here's one for polyethylene. And I sent it to them. They go, okay, it's going up in two weeks. Under the ass of every astronaut on all the flights, <laughs> this thing that I made, you know, locally on this island, and my DNA goes to space. I, I wanted to go to space. By the way, when I was at UH, I got a grant to work at NASA. And the lavas I got from the submarine, I did submersible work. And I got to work at NASA Johnson Space Center. And I went down two miles in the ocean. And this is just a sidebar. This is a styrofoam cup, but I think that's crushed when I take one away. But and you know about in the news, the submarine that just imploded. Okay. I went down two miles deep off Galapagos to work on my lava field area. That's what I came to Hawaii for. And you're in this little metal ball, but in the superstructure, they put a little net bag with these, and you write your name on it. And then because two, can you, you've been to the bottom of the swimming pool, your ears start to hurt. That's six or eight feet. Imagine the 10,000 feet. The pressure's unbelievable. That's why all those people die from a pinhole. So that styrofoam, that's what it turns like. The styrofoam cup shrinks down. You guys can pass that around. No one's deal that, please. <laughs> anyway, it was a pretty cool experience. Two hours to the bottom, four on the bottom, two to get up. And this is the weirdest thing. I still don't understand. I had two dives, eight hours each. My second dive was with a woman, not that that mattered, but neither, no one went to the bathroom. Either dive. Think about that. I still don't know. I don't, I, and it's pressurized, so it's not like this. When someone answers that question, they have a little cup and they have an attachment for women. But I mean, it's like it's like this big. I mean, the whole I'm claustrophobic, so I was kind of freaked out about it. I just put my eye on the window and looked at these weird creatures. There was like looked like a monkey skull with a clear eel tail. It's translucent. Just crazy stuff. It was snowing bioluminescence. It looked like a fluorescent green snowstorm because there's a lot of life there really cool so i got up and i got this grant to work at nasa with these lava samples and i thought i'm going to be the first guy to go inner space and outer space because they were taking scientists and then the challenger blew up and that was the end of taking scientists so close i'm getting is this, this thing went to space and just came down 
SpaceX. And I'll take it. My DNA went to SpaceX, but not me. Okay, and then just for roots of what, what, you know, where you come from and where you're going, and you know, you, you gotta have this kick ass attitude and you gotta want it. My grandmother came from Europe and her brothers left her there because back in the day, they didn't, you know, women were like worse class citizens than they are now. And they're not anymore. The guys are dominating now. Anyway, this is my grandmother. She was one of the early medical doctors. This is the University of Chicago Medical School. And it's hard to see, but that, that's a cadaver. So her expression, I always interpret as, you mess with me, you'll be the cadaver. So that's kind of one of my inspirations. She was kind of a maniac. And this is, I'm really honored to be here because I really, really believe in cross pollinating. You guys, the best ideas, first of all, commonly come from people outside their fields. Streamer's a perfect example. I have nothing to do with survival, maritime. I'm a scientist that was a geologist that worked on gold deposits and then volcanoes. It has nothing to do with that. But, but I have interests and if you interact with people that are outside your field, that's when the good stuff happens. And to have a place like Rise where you guys can live together, work together is incredible. The one big bummer, and it's not your fault because you guys were born at the wrong time, is those smoke. This is my phone, for real, okay? This is not a joke. I don't want to look at color TV. I want to communicate in black and white with buttons. I want to think in color and communicate in black and white. And when I was a kid, if you played with a, if you watched TV all day, we gave you shit endlessly. Now, somehow, it's okay. Everyone watches TV all day. And even coming in here today, everyone's quiet out there. In the old days, there'd be a roar of people laughing, talking. So I really encourage you guys, when you interact, turn the phones off. And I, I know if I ever have grandkids or anything like that, I was telling your director today, the, the only way to do it is let's go on that boat and your thousand dollar phone is going to break if you bring it. So you can't bring it. So I'm trying to figure out a way to maybe infuse salt water into this environment. So we can ruin all the phones. And in, in Europe, they have cell phone blockers. They're illegal in the United States, but I'm going to get one for my house. Right, right, right. Again, no offense. You guys grew up with smartphones, they're fabulous tools. But try to limit your addiction, you know, and, and try to read. That's the other. People come up to me and want to talk about anything. Don't quote podcasts. I do podcasts. That's cool, fun. Read stuff. Read articles. Read papers. Read reviews. Read. Even 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 on my phone. I, I have an iPad. I, I look at Instagram and Facebook. I don't even listen. I turn the sound off and look at the subtitles. But. That's my little sermon for that. That's enough for that. <laughs> oh, and also travel. You know, the thing is, you guys already live out here, and that's great, but travel and meet different people, different places, a lot of good inspiration comes from traveling, interacting with other people, and you just never know. You never know where inspiration comes from, and it could be from a horrible experience, out of necessity, you know? You're, you're, the toilet breaks, and you're in a developing world nation, and all of a sudden you have a great idea for a new toilet paper. Sidebar, the dude wipes guy was at the Shark Tank. You ever heard of dude wipes? Oh yeah. I met that guy. I mean, these guys are just, it's unbelievable what people make money on. And they make a lot of money. Here's the submersible stuff, and that's what I used to look like when I was young and vibrant. It's hot, 100 degrees on the bottom, going in, and then you come out, and there's, anyway, it's really cool down there. Some of my other ideas, I invented a, I'm a surfer, I invented a inflatable rescue board. board. This, this material, drop stitch nylon, thousands of strings connected, uh, inflatable ice in the 1940s. They had this for the floors of life rafts, so it wouldn't be collapsible. The strings are able to be inflated and be rigid. I saw that and immediately said, I want to make inflatable rescue board paddle boards. And I did it, I got patents and military grants, and it's a long story, but I won't bore you with it. But I, I here's the patent for that one. And of course, there was a streamer on it, just because you got to have all your stuff. I, it morphed into a rescue board, a little rescue board. And this, I'm going to take the same analogy I did with the self-deploying fighter pilot streamer. Guess what? No one wants this. And I made a mistake. I made it white. 
I should have never made it white because it looks like a pool toy. I should have made it orange. But I was thinking from, from living here and knowing how hot things get, white is the coolest. But white looks like a toy. So I actually hand painted that one in the right corner black. It already looks cooler that way. But still, it's too low tech. It's too dull. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have a picture. Here's what I'm doing with this. And I may be working with someone that's, you know, Ashton, one of the kids here, he might be getting involved with it. And I have some other people that are UH people. <clears throat> I want to airdrop this and make it a drone so you can drive it to people without risking another person. And, and this, that will make it interesting to people. And that's the way it's going to be marketed. So I'm, I'm in the process of making a, putting a propeller on it and having an RC control. So hopefully next time I come by one day, I'll have one with me. This, sometimes the dumbest ideas, you know, I used to go to parties and people said, you know, what's your, what's your next invention? I'm like, and I used to just joke just to get rid of people. And I go, two condoms and a string. They're like, what? Oh yeah, that's the smallest life jacket in the world. It's true. It's like a joke. You guys know what condoms are, right? It's the safe sex portion of the presentation. <laughs> Blow them up. They're really well tested. You tie them, and you have a string through your arms. It's my whole premise with safety is if you can't put it on your body, you're not. You're going to die without it. Did you know that when they find men that have died and drowned? You know, 60% of them have their zipper down when they find them? That's true. I don't know you know, the exact figure. You know why? Okay, because when you take a pee on a boat, you try to go right to the edge, not mess up your boat or your clothes, and you fall in. When you fall in, the last thing you're gonna do is pull your zipper up before you drown. So that, so that is true. So now, if you had a, if you had something that could fit in your pocket, just a backup life, backup flotation device. I'm not saying make it as good as a big life. So, and again, testing showed, I got a small grant after everyone laughed at me. I still get a military grant to study this. And I built one, and this, when I went and tested it in rough water, it's pulling, I tied it, these aren't condoms, okay? The condom was a joke, it wasn't a joke. It's, it's a good idea, still. If, if you said, let's go, we're going, we're going out to sea, 50-50, we're gonna die, I'll take two condoms and a piece of string. Maybe it'll help. But if this is on the market, I won't buy this one. But when, it, when I'm in rough seas, it's pulling at it, and I'm like, oh, this is this isn't good because it's rough water. So I, I came up with I think the best version. It's not how many pictures of it, but you know, like when you buy a dozen oranges, it comes with that netting. I surround it with netting, tied in the netting, so it. it, it dissipates and it distributes all the stress around it instead of at that tie point. Again, I mean, two cons of the string, it's evolving. So I'm, I'm still, this is another one. I'm getting old now, so I've given up this attitude that I'm gonna do everything myself. I'm over it. So and he's, anyone who's interested in the two cons of the string business, <laughs> anyway, it's all, it's all, you know, and I'm trying to do like a group of survival products. That's the idea. And this is the greatest idea I've ever had. And it, it's, I can't figure out how to optimize it. Okay. Um, you know what Gore-Tex is? Raincoat? It breathes, so you don't sweat when you're wearing it. I took that idea and said, how about a black plastic bag with a clear window and a panel of Gore-Tex? Put salt water or polluted water in it. The sun heats it, it evaporates. And guess what? When it gets to the Gore-Tex, that vapor, evaporated water, goes through it, but salt crystals get stuck. It's a portable solar desalinator. It's, and I got a grant to do that. This is it right here. Now this thing could save your life, absolutely. And even if there's a hurricane on this island and everyone has to go stand and walk, stand in line to get water, I'd like to have one of these too, because you get a couple mouthfuls a day. The problem is it only made not even, it made about this much water. And they, the, the military wants a liter a day. So you know what I did? I connected a bunch of them like a streamer. But then they went to, to the Philippines and tested it, and my luck, it was cloudy that day. So, but I know how to make it. And the, 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 the mistake I made is 
water likes to stick together, so it sloshes around. I need to build it with like micro pillars, so when it fills up, it's only this thin. Because a thin lens of water, put a, put a baking sheet in the sun in the road, it'll evaporate in about five minutes. Put that same amount of water in a cup, there's not enough surface area for it to evaporate. So I have to improve on that. It's another thing I'm going to be working on. Or not. <laughs> Whatever, I may run out of time, and that'll, that'll suck, but it's okay. Good job, dreams. This is another one. That I, I was at a trade show at a, at a UH thing at the Capitol years ago, and I, everyone saw my streamer, and a, a bunch of other scientists from UH said, I, they said, oh, I could, I could find that with my camera system. I'm like, really? They, I go, how about satellites? They go, yes, satellites or cameras. And at the time, the military looked for things based on shape, like this, this orange line. They, they'd see that line. All the sensors that scan for things look for space, spatial, but not spectral, color. And we were the first guys to come up with a video search and rescue system that can see things based on color and shape. But the mistake we made here was we were in the big boys game, the Lockheeds and the Raytheons, and because we took military money to fund it, we couldn't go after them. And, and they could always say it's used for military. So we, we just got blown out of the water. And now they all use this. They all, every sensor they have uses color and shape, not just shape. It's okay. You win some, you lose some. This is what, this is my latest idea, which is kind of a failure. One, one of the things, it's, it's not a failure, it's just, it's just not going to go anywhere because I encourage you when you invent something to invent something small. When I get an order for 20 of these, it fits in one new postal box for 20 bucks. I can send 20 of these anywhere. This thing is too big. The idea here, again, biomimicry. I want to mimic how you, you have water bikes and you spin them, but they have a propeller, right? Have you ever seen a fish with a propeller? No. Fish have tails. Whales and dolphin tails go like that, fish go like that. So my idea was to make a bike that propelled the tail. And it doesn't even have to work well, it would be cool. Because you could ride it and you'd see a splash. And then I started thinking about it, I'm like, if I make one, where am I gonna put it? You know, it's just too big. So again, this one kind of died. This is the only invention I've ever made that didn't make any money because I used my own money for the patent, which I use on all of them, but the others all got grants or led to sales. And, and just for fun, I'm not sure where I have it in the talk, but I want to show you my first invention. My parents thought I was crazy, and again, you ever see these little motors they used to sell? Yeah, so I need two to polish. So I took a straw, and I put it on top of this motor, and then it spins. And this was five years old. But people say, are your parents proud of you? And I go, no, not really. I mean, a little. This thing spins. Anyway. It spins, and you put it up your nose. This is the electric nose picker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one didn't go anywhere, but this is where it all started for me. And this is where my parents thought I was psychotic. <laughs> okay. My parents also thought, when, it, when I was in like high school, they said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to go into PR. I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> who, who says that? Public relations? And at the time, I was so shy, I could never do this, ever. I could barely speak. And they're like, <clears throat> and they, didn't, you want, they want to encourage you. They don't want to like, screw you up for life by saying, you'll never do that. But they just laughed at me. So. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have a little fuel to get out, you know, you, you know, you know it's not really revenge, but you just need a fuel. You guys follow sports, you know, look at these sports guys. Just, the badass sports guys are the ones with the chip on their shoulder, right? And I kind of have this chip on my shoulder. You know, I grew up in Miami. The waves were this big, the wind were mean, you know. It was horrible. I know it wasn't horrible, it was good. But I wanted to, and every surf, we go to surf movies, and it's all about Hawaii. I hated Hawaii, it was too good. <laughs> Trade winds, beautiful, just unreal. So, you know, that chip, I've been on the surf chip, has been on the shoulder, 
and then my parents saying PR, and then people saying you can't do that. You got to work for someone. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to, you got to. No, you don't. You could do whatever you want if you can pull it off. And here's my other over, overall theme in life is a little arithmetic here. How many hours in a week? Seven times twenty-four. One, I think it's one sixty-eight or one eighty-eight. Whatever, it's a lot. Take forty away for your job. Forty hours minus one eighty still leaves one forty. Take another forty away for sleeping. That still leaves like eighty or hundred. So you do your work on these crazy stuff at nights and weekends. You don't quit your day job, which is your, your students. You don't quit your day job so you can quit it one day. And you have to focus because all this stuff takes forever. Okay, it takes twice as much money and twice as much time. So you can't interfere with your source of money. So get a job, work for someone, but in the back of your mind, you're like, I'm gonna go tell this asshole I quit. And I'm, I'm gonna wait till I can do that. Because when I can do that, and that drives me to this day, because people say, you, you gotta work, you gotta, you gotta shave, you gotta, you gotta go show up. I know you are, no I don't. And it's like, you're too old, no I'm not, you're too this, you know I'm not, am I? Well, I'll show you. And you show them by working hard and persevering, you, you don't quit. And that's what I try to do. And I, you know, it's worked so far. I wrote a couple books, Hardcore Vending is one, and I do a lot of outreach for kids. I really like talking to kids, especially younger kids, because their minds aren't gone. I don't know where you guys are on that spectrum. <laughs> because I talk to the Hogan entrepreneurs and college kids, and you know, like this class, some girl said, you know, at those kinds of talks, it's like, maybe these kids are a little older. Some little kids, they'll say, I have a cat. You know, that's cool. <laughs> but like one of these girls came up, one of these people came up with a, I used to tell them, you know, invent, solve a problem. Whatever problems in your life, if, you, if you're going to school with your brother and he's bugging you, build a barrier so he can't get to you. And one of these girls came up with a good idea, which was a mouthpiece to brush your teeth. She didn't like brushing her teeth with, with things. And it's really a good idea. You can put a mouthpiece and just kind of chew on it. And anyway, just a little, eat. It's almost, and the other, by the way, the guy I worked with originally when I was a student that got me into the inventing world, he invented the smoke in the cockpit system. If a plane gets smoke in the cockpit, you can't just open a window. The smoke doesn't go out. So a little smoke bomb this big can put a whole plane down. It's a scary thought, but it's true. This guy invented a smoke, it's like a, a small balloon that's clear that inflates and goes up to the windshield and enables the pilot to put their goggles to the window, to the, to the air, to the, like the balloon, which goes to the window and your instruments are slid on the side. Brilliant. Absolutely juvenile. A five-year-old runs around looking through a balloon at people. That's a brilliant idea. And he, DuPont, licensed it from them. It, it, I think UPS and FedEx still fly with a lot of corporate jets. It's not on the flight you take commercially because they don't want to do anything that costs too much money, so that's another story. I, I did a kid's book. You, you heard of uh, Curious George? That's one of my heroes. You know? So I, I'm trying. I try to do a Curious George. I think me and my dog, and we get in, we get in trouble, and then we invent our way out. The, the guy that did the uh, illustration is pretty famous. He did the Grizzlies. You heard about the Bears? Yeah, that was pretty cool. And then my wife, unfortunately, got MS, and she became paralyzed. And I took care of her for 19 years while raising these little kids. And that's why that, that mouthpiece uh, toothpaste thing is so interesting to me, because I had to brush your teeth. And it was cool, it was an incredible experience, but I wrote this book to kind of, as like a man's perspective, who's an inventor scientist, to become a caregiver. Because I'm not your typical caregiver. I mean, when the New York publisher said, you know something, we can't find a picture for the cover. Because all the pictures have women pushing men in wheelchairs. It's so rare for a guy to be pushing a woman. So, again, so, and the other thing is, I don't know if I put it on here. Yeah. She couldn't, uh, she couldn't move, right? But she was like a marathon runner. So, we found this, I don't even know why I have this, that machine down there, it pedals your feet. 
but it does it automatically. I don't know where the exercise in is for able-bodied people. But I took a camping chair, and I'm into, I guess I would call it flashing them. Like I said before, I'm going out to see them. We grab two condoms on the screen. She's bugging me. She needs to exercise. This will help atrophy. I'm going to go buy that machine. And how can I use it really quick? I'm going to take two belts and strap her legs to it and have her wear Crocs. She, pedal, she burned out 12 engines, and we calculated over like 10 years, she pedaled around the world eight times. So it was huge, and it made her feel, she could see her legs moving, helped her digestion, prevents atrophy, and then what happened to my corporate attorney, I said, I got a couple of you should know, no matter what this is. Barred me from doing anything. But if anyone knows, if anyone in this situation, it's a good thing. It really helped out and helped her a lot. And then, that was the most recent book I wrote. I'm kind of a, Exercise free. I surf three ways on the North Shore. I don't want to die. If I do die, it's not because I wasn't prepared. To be prepared, you got to eat good, you got to exercise. I do all sorts of crazy stuff, but it's not that hard. You just got to eat right. It's the same thing about phones. Everyone, there's shitty food everywhere. You got to search out the good stuff. Absolutely. Really good. I make a six bean Indian curry of crop. Every day, not even over brown rice, from the bar with a quarter head of raw cabbage from Maui, steamed eggplant, and then here's the thing I'm a chocolate guy. I'm drink coffee. So I eat about, I go to Chef Zone. You heard of Chef Zone? I buy chocolate like this. They, they think I'm a sushi. They think I work at a restaurant. Oh, you're baking? No, I eat it by the hand. <laughs> Like when I was a kid, I liked Mounds bars. Remember Mounds bars? Coconut and chocolate. So I, you know, coconut oil. And I used to, I used to eat lunch, a big spread of 16 curry. And, and I don't even know over brown rice, I eat over barbs. It's all about the fiber carbs. So you've got a, the lowest uh, carb and the highest fiber. That's what you want. So, I want at my dessert, I used to have five spoons and you dip it into the coconut oil each time with the chocolate. And I got sick. Coconut oil was like peachy dish. So a friend of mine said, Why don't you pour it in ice cube trays? So now I make ice cube trays of coconut oil. So I eat while I'm eating my second mouthful of chocolate, I throw the coconut oil in there. This is like a blend. The perfect. <laughs> Hey, child, I, I got some good trips in recently. I just got back from Iceland last year, saw an eruption there. I got in India, I saw tigers. I don't know. Get more exposure, more, more opportunity. First of all, the government, the ideal way to go in is with a map and a national stock number. So this has national stock numbers, meaning it's in the system. And that same that same example of how I did those hundred faxes, there's the World Aviation Directory that had all the lists of militaries all over the world with faxes. So I would write to like General So and So Turkish Air Force. And the Army, the RM, or the Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, I'd write to Senator, I'd write to anyone who would which is like a buckshot, you know, finishing all the lines up. And again, positive, pain in the ass, this is going to save you, keep doing it. And then the thing that I love and hate are trade shows. Okay? Trade shows suck, but they're great. <laughs> go to one in a month. I go every year, get my food. Brad, no good, you know, if you're talking to your trade show neighbor. But you know what? Trade shows put you all on the same field. I dress up, I shave, and you, I used to go to them and I didn't have a booth, but you just kind of wander around and kind of coach people from other booths and get good at reading, reading uh, name tags upside down. And I don't tell many people this, but 
I've actually followed guys into the urinal to talk to them. Never know. You've heard of the elevator pitch. I have the urinal. A little riskier, but many reasons. But strange. It absolutely. <laughs> That puts you on the same ground. Not only are you meeting potential customers, you're meeting potential licensees. You may not be big enough to sell to the military. I really wasn't. When I went to the licensing now, after Pacific Business News, I had a business plan thing and they wrote an article about it. And someone came up and said, after a media play about this, I had a bidding war for a licensee. This guy wanted to build a big company. Yes. Lobbying. Lobbyists is another thing. These are all different levels. But the thing that's the cheapest is just reaching out to the media initially. But trade shows give you a good idea of what other people are selling, what the customers like. And there's so many trade shows. So it's, it's endless. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't think it's impossible to answer that question fully because you could be selling toilet paper to the military, or you could be selling safety or ammunition. I also love to point out that I do work with militaries, but I'm on the life savings. I even sold some of these to China. You know, I, you know, we're not this one, I'm not supposed to sell to any non-NATO countries. Actually, they have a whole rule of I can sell these to anyone because I want to save a lot. Of money. It's what I Journey. You can't, you can't kind of, you can't let the first couple failures frustrate you. you know, I, I know that's like a, it's a cliche. It is fail, 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 but it's true. Um, I'm just like story. Sounds like you're just the guy that would like jump on everyone's and that's great, you know. But throughout your entrepreneurial journey, what would you say is one thing that makes you regret? During my journey? Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes I say things out of line and you see I didn't ask what the rating of this presentation I have PG, R, PC 17. <laughs> and I talked early on with the military and I learned the hard way that you don't bash other people's stuff. And you see at the beginning of the talk, I talked about flares, smoke, and sea dye. I was saying all that. And apparently, someone loved that stuff. It really took offense to me. That it spread this rumor about you know, this guy, he loves C Dye Marker. He loves C Dye Marker. So I learned from that. But it was kind of painful. And, and also, who you work with. You know, it's just, it's really, what's really sad is very few people have original ideas. So when you do, people try to kind of rip you off. I, I have, Another situation, I had a rep in Canada that wanted to license me. When I 15 year license, that he wanted to take it over, and they would, but he wouldn't pay me guaranteed rights. I didn't give it to anyone to sit on. So he ended up packing off. And then, like a year later, he shows up at a trade show with a rip off version. I'm like, really? And then the Canadian Air Force put a like a $200,000 contract on it, a bunch of these for all the flights. Flight check. And the guy wanted it, not in the best. And you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. I'll write a letter. So I wrote 15 letters to the head of the Canadian government procurement. And there's a fine line between threatening and making them understand. The way I did it was because I'm well versed in being a media whore. I said, you, You're going to give this version, which is pirated and not tested. To your Canadian Air Force men, guess what? I'm going to talk to the Canadian CNN and see what they think about it. I didn't say that, but I was watching closely. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't want to hire attorneys. I didn't have the money to hire an attorney to go to another country. It's even harder. The guy, but all these letters kind of work. And the part about, look, this is, you're using a pirated piece of equipment that was never tested like this one. And you're putting your people at risk, and they finally send them all back to God. So there's a good story and a bad story, but it's hard to know who to work with. You know? People are all, it's like my kids and other people that are at God's age. I would tell them, you got to live with someone before you marry. 
You know, I know that may be against your beliefs and all that. I'm not there. You still should do it in secret. Because you got to know what that person wakes up like when they're pissed off, when they're happy, when they're sad, how they brush their teeth, how they sleep, how they snore, how they drool, whatever. It's so critical. I mean, yeah, this is not about relations, but it's true for licensee. I didn't know enough about it. I thought I could trust it. And I'm very trusting and I'm gullible enough to say, you know, it's working. So vet your people well. And if you want it done right, what do they say? You got to do it yourself. That's why to be your own boss and your own employee, that way, if you, you know, it's like I say, I got a shitty boss, me. I have a horrible employee, me. That's it. But there's no one else to blame. It's, it's on me. I contract things out. That's fine. But I say, you do this for me, I will pay you this. But I don't want to employ people. And this is the real pickle that people are in now. Again, back to the phones, but how can you hire? I, I remember I got my daughter to help on me. They gave her first deal, and she's helped me. She's taking Instagram breaks. I'm like, you know, how does this cut into your hour for you? You're allowed five minutes an hour or something. You know, it was like a cigarette break. So people that are lucky, you know, that are addicted to the, we all, by the way, all those Instagram, all those recent social media companies, they make it. Don't think it's a, it's a problem. They do that. They know how to do that, and they do it well. We all love spending money. Yeah. Initially, myself, my father helped me. He set up a line, and then that line, I licensed the licensee for 15 years, and I got the lines back. So I make them now. And I, I enjoy it. It's crowded. The original 15 year license, it was so early in the game that I did something that I would not recommend, but it worked. That is, I included me as part of the license. It was like his consultant. So he kind of owned me. It always bothered me for 15, 15 years. He could say, the first time I thought I had to go down to Ahead where he was to his office, but he didn't require that. But I gave away my consulting as part of the license to make it more attractive to him. So he had to pay me six figures a year guaranteed, but he got me as like an employee. So that was one thing I did. But the smartest thing I ever did with the license agreement is this one sentence all improvement, enhancements, modifications, and improvements belong. So even though this thing we got on an Air Force team, we developed this, they helped me develop the original idea. They all signed the patent rights back to me. That was huge. Because when you if you want to get it back, you got to own whoever owns it controls it. So what's um some advice that you give to us college students for okay. going forward? I think to invent what you know or start the other thing is to start a business. Don't think about the home run. You know, I've had a lot of success with this. But you know something? A small niche business is really valuable too. So if you can find something that somehow people want, I mean, the guy, um, famous guy that worked for Apple used to say, if you can make something for a dollar and sell it for five, you've got a great business. So find that. Find that dollar that you can sell for five. And I would add, make it this big or smaller. So you don't have storage <laughs> and distribution. I, I can I can stuff a thousand I can stuff like a hundred thousand dollars worth of these is like only in that little corner. Whereas a hundred thousand dollars worth of bikes these mix So that's a good one. I would just say start small to get something and to do more than one thing. You know, start that and then you do something else related to that or other. Ones. But keep your day job. Keep being a student or get a job. Don't rely on something to pay off quickly. Or at all. And if you do something you enjoy doing that you can speak to, people believe you when you're passionate about it. I still believe in it just as much. It solves a problem. So if you can solve a problem or just make it, it make some people feel better about a problem, make it inexpensively and sell for a little margin, you've got a business. And don't the startup world, they all want you to take money too. That's the other thing I caution. 
Don't get invested. Even the Shark Tank thing, them blowing me off was the best thing that ever happened. Mark Cuban wasn't going to call me, but his assistant, some 30 year old kid's going to be calling me saying, Hey, why don't you do this trade show? Why are you still in Hawaii? Who are you? You know, that would drove me crazy. So be careful what you, what you wish. Yeah, so uh, sort of getting back to the whole like, day job. Right. So, like, you are an entrepreneur now, like, you're an inventor, but you, like, went to college to get your, like, a PhD in, um, like, both. So, yeah, uh, it's, like, super, super cool, but so did you, like, always know that you, like, wanted to, uh, it's, like, to be, like, doing the monitor the leadership? Yes. Did... In my case, I did. My father worked at home. He started his own business. And that, that hardcore inventing book was going to be called Inventing in Your Underwear, which was an homage to him. Because the guy, he was happy. He was jolly. He, didn't, he had a regular job. And he built this little business on the side in our house till it took over. And he could quit his day job. And we had, a, we had a sign in our house that said, just say no to real terms. So I was programming. I saw the happiness, the flexibility. As a surfer, if, if you work nine to five, you can't surf. I mean, what if Tuesday morning, I have a buddy who's a psychologist for 30 years is telling me, I got a three day weekend. I'm like, yeah, baby. The waves don't come only on the weekends. So, you know, flexibility. And it may not be. That's why I encourage you just try it on the side. That's the best way to try it. Try something small on the side. And it doesn't have to be a home run idea. You don't need investors, just a small business. I mean, not enough people argue or advocate for small business. I think that's, you know, you can, my first business was, you know, the blow pop. Yeah. I found a place you could buy a box of them, get drunk, you can go to school, <laughs> sell blow pops. I bought them for the time and sold them for a quarter. It's a good business. So I got a free blow pop. What's your favorite wave on the North Shore? Excellent. <laughs> but that wave I showed you, yeah, did blast up. Devil's Rock. What that is? Oh, yeah. Off the polo field, there's a submerged rock a mile offshore. Yeah. That board I showed you is in balsa. Hollowed out balsa wood. <laughs> the craziest wave. I've kicked out a wave of humpback whales closer to shore. Oh, is that the I, my, part of my crazy? I paddle two miles a day, lay down paddle for lunch break. I do 51 by three dives, 150 strokes, just to train. I almost got killed with hammerhead in that way. I got held down 20 ways in a set, and, and you know, it's like this much white water, but if you go down 10 feet, it goes over you. Yeah. It's really have enough time to get breath. I do that 20 times, I'm like, no way. That's not the thing. I train, now I can do 50 in a row, I can do 100. Because you think about a whale swimming from here to Alaska, swimming. I don't So you go, Mellow, get down, do the kick flip, move down. Do I swim and do that? No dogs, just boy and pop. No things, no dogs. When you surf here, you know, things or dogs. Yeah. The biggest mistake surfers make is not know the submerged part. The Devil's Rock is like a left point friend, but it's like one of the It's the best way to work. I have like 47 seconds to ride there. It's so in. The lips are in this thing. It's psychotic. I'll probably die there. <laughs> it's okay. So you talked about the importance of reading. And yes. Um, other than the book you wrote, uh, do you have a favorite book? Uh, oh. Yes. Yeah. I'll pick up girls. <laughs> work. Okay. Um, face black heart. You know, Sin Tzu, the art of war. This woman wrote a business maybe it's called Thick Face Black Heart. I just live by it. It may be dated now. Thick face means you don't listen to people say you can't do this. It's thick skin. And black heart means you go for your dreams. And as in war, if I have to kill you, you get my dreams off the food. But the, the most honorable way to get it is without hurting people. So that's kind of what I've followed. And, and, it's, and one of the great passages in that book quotes it. Embrace your perceived negativity. My perceived negativity as a kid was I wanted to be a surfer. And in Miami, if you were a surfer, you were a heroine. That was there was no difference. In Hawaii, we honor surfers, kings and queens surf. In Miami, the drug addicts. 
So I was told, tried to overcome that my whole life because it was a perceived negativity. So I, I, I did it anyway. I don't know if that book is still holds out. I also try to read real books. You know, I, I learned, my brother used to read like a book a day. Sports. So I decided I took it. The best class I ever took was literature. They made us all these classes Jungle, Scarlet Letter, all that stuff they made you read. I decided then these books are great. I'm going to read all of them. So I read, I read all the classics the movie, Made, Tolstoy, Art Heart, War and Peace, Anna Karenina. Those are the great books. If you want to just use great books, go to the literature section. I don't remember the video. Oh, yeah. I think face black card is good. Any other questions from your uh, well, uh, yeah, will also be staying back a little bit. Um, so you can come and network with him.